Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, a day where we can gather together to worship you and study your word. And Father, as we continue our study through the book of James, just open this letter up to our hearts and our lives, Lord. Just again, not just information, but the application, how we can grow in our relationship with you. We want to mature in the faith, Lord. Teach us those lessons we need to learn and help us to apply them to our lives. And as always, Lord, as we come to worship you, we do so with hearts that are in love with you. We want to honor you. We want to praise you. And Lord, may these songs that we sing unto you, may they minister our hearts and draw us close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to read from Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary, to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. <clears throat> I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be, sent, or will be stopped. This morning, if you would, turn to James chapter 4 as we continue our study through this letter that James wrote to persecuted Jewish Christians who had to flee their homes, had to flee because of their faith in Christ. And what James is trying to do is he's trying to encourage them by helping them to grow in the faith, to mature in the faith, not to remain spiritual babies in Christ. In other words, no matter what they were going through, they needed to live out their faith. They needed to live what they said they believed. And I think that's obviously true for each of us. No matter what we're going through, we need to live out our faith. We need to live in a way that people can see that our faith is real. And the only way that's going to happen is as we grow, as we mature in the Lord. And we have seen James speak of the fact that that faith without works is dead. It's not real. I mean, you could talk all you want about how spiritual you are, how mature you are, but if there's nothing to back it up, then the words are empty. They're meaningless. You know, James said in James 1.22 to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And as you read God's word, as you take God's word into your life, that's knowledge. But again, it just doesn't end there. You have to apply what God has said in his word to your life, and that's wisdom, living what you say you believe. And let me be, be clear on this. You know, works don't save us. They really are the evidence for our faith or the fruit that's produced in our lives as we're attached to Christ, the true vine. And we saw back in James chapter 1, the believer and suffering as the focus. In other words, trials will come our way. There's no doubt about that. that. We shouldn't be surprised about that. But James says, count it all joy when you fall into these various trials because God is growing you through these trials. He's maturing you in the faith. We have to also be wise here because Satan is there and he's going to try to tempt you to sin. Don't let him. Don't take his bait and get hooked. We saw in James chapter 2 that about the believer in service how we're to live out our faith by not showing partiality, by accepting people, to be courteous to them, to have compassion upon them, to help those in need, because again, faith without works is dead. And last time in James chapter 3, he showed us the believer in a speech, another tough one. Each chapter gets tough, tougher, I think. But James was dealing with how we are to talk so that our tongue needs to be controlled by God's Spirit working in our lives. And 
a tongue that's not in control is not consistent with how a believer is to live out his faith. In fact, in verses 8 through 10, James said of cha in chapter 3, no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. By brethren, these things ought not to be so. I think it's clear. We need to be careful what comes forth from our lips. In chapter 4, as we're going to begin this morning in, we're going to be looking at the believer in a separated life. And you're going to see this is something that the church is struggling with and obviously believers are struggling with. Because there's a war going on between the spirit and the flesh. We, I think we understand that. Now, before we get to our text this morning, look at how James chapter 3 closes in verses 17 and 18. Listen to what he says. He says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the beauty that flows from a life that is guided from above, guided by God. It's godly wisdom that's manifested in our lives. But as we're going to see, chapter 4 is going to open up with fights and quarrels. Obviously, it's not godly wisdom. It's not from above. It's from below. It's earthly. In fact, in verses 14 through 16 of James chapter 3, James says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. It's not a pretty picture, but James not, is not trying to paint a pretty picture for us. He's just trying to show the reality. This is the way it is. You know, there is a huge contrast between the two walks. First of all, the peace that results when Christians walk in the Spirit. Mature Christians will live in peace. They'll get along with each other. Why? Because it's not about them. It's about the Lord. And what happens is when it's about them, when it's about us, it seems like the littlest thing will cause us to get mad, to be badmouth another person, and we need to be careful. That's a picture of a carnal Christian or immature Christian. And what happens is in their life it produces strife and conflict internal and external struggles. And James is telling us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we need to grow up. We need to mature in the faith, and you're not going to be able to do this on your own. You need to surrender your life to the Lord, for His Spirit will give you what you need to live out your faith. And you know, that's what Paul talked about in Galatians 5. He said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, that's, this is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And let me say this. Whoever you surrender your life to will be manifested in the things that you say and the things that you do. I've called this study, Where Do Wars Come From? And there's basically three points that we're going to be looking at. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we're going to look at the flesh. In verses 4 through 5 of James chapter 4, the world. And then in verses 6 through 7 of James chapter 4, the devil. And if you think about it, how is the flesh controlled? By the world and the devil, right? That's it. We're influenced by worldly things. And the devil likes to influence us as well. But we face enemies every day. Are we prepared to do that? Are we able to stand strong in the faith that God has given to us? We need to. You know, one article I was reading said, you know, we can't ignore enemies. When I was a little kid, my dad and I went down to a bay cottage in southern Texas. And when we got there, we discovered that the cottage was filled with wasps. I've never seen anything like it in my life. There were absolutely millions of wasps. When we opened the door, they just flooded out on us. They were even in the roll in the shade. 
You pull the window shade down and out would come the wasps. They were all over the place. Well, we went to work and we cleaned out all the wasps. Then we laid down that evening to go to sleep and I heard something buzz and buzz and buzz underneath me. And I lifted my pillow and wasps were still everywhere between the two mattresses on my bunk. Again, we cleaned them out. Why? Well, with the family reunion beginning in a day or two, we wanted it clean for them. It was essential for the health and happiness of all the family that we deal with this problem. That is something that is so important. There are enemies that are just dangerous out there, and we need to be able to deal with them. Give them a death blow, you might say. And I'm not speaking of people because we're to love our enemies, pray for them, and so on. What I'm speaking about and what I've broken these verses down into is the flesh, the world, and the devil. How are we going to take a stand against these things? I was talking to a, a brother yesterday at the men's retreat in, uh, at Wisconsin Rapids, and you know, he was telling me how he just couldn't understand his daughter. You know, he, she, he tried to raise her up in a Christian home, and she even had a child out of wedlock, and she kept the child. She didn't abort the child, and it was wonderful. But now, as she's older, and the child she had is older, they are pro-abortion. They are for killing a child, and he couldn't understand it. That's because the world and the devil influenced her flesh. And she's come to these decisions. We are not living in the 1700s. We are in the 21st century. We know where life begins. In fact, I don't know, maybe some of you remember this. I, I do. It was very vivid in my mind. In the 1960s, when Life magazine had the pictures inside the womb of the development of a child. And I looked at it and go, that's a baby. Now we say it's a piece of tissue. Well, how, what happened? How is it a piece of tissue? I, I see the child right there. In fact, the Bible says God has formed us in the womb. And now we are saying, I'm going to take that life? The world, the devil, influences us. We've got to be careful. And I think these are really some important lessons for us to learn, apply to our lives. And it'll take us a few weeks to get through these three points, uh, but I think they're, under, they're very important. So let's begin reading James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, uh, as we focus on the believer and the separated life, and specifically where do wars come from, and this morning it will be dealing with the flesh. Look at what he says. Where do wars or battles and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own, your pleasures. Again, where do wars come from? James tells us right here in these verses, it's the flesh. And keep in mind, James is not speaking to unbelievers here. He's speaking to believers, the church. And as he looks at the church now, as he's looking at these believers, what is he seeing? Wars, fights. Well, that's not right. And the, these battles, these fights, these wars that are going on inside the church are coming from their selfish desires. It's the flesh. In fact, the word pleasure or lust in the Greek, we get our word hedonist from or hedonism from. And that's never positive. It speaks of an uncontrolled desire to fulfill every passion of the heart, to satisfy sensual desires. It's pure selfishness. And maybe you're thinking, you know, hey, not me, I'm a Christian. I've crucified the flesh. It's not a problem for me. Wow, you're doing really good. Because we are all capable of trying to satisfy the flesh, to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have those desires, and they entice the flesh, and then the problem arises. John Mason Brown was a drama critic and speaker, and he was really, really well known for his witty and informative lectures on theatrical topics. And he made one of his first important appearances at a lecturer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he was really pleased, he was excited, but he was also pretty nervous about it. And his nerves were not helped because he noticed by the light of the slide projector, that someone was copying his every gesture. 
Oh man, that's got to be irritating. After a time, he broke off as a lecture, lecture and announced with great dignity that, hey, if anyone's not enjoying the talk, you can go, it's okay. Nobody did, and the mimicking continued. It was another 10 minutes before Brown realized that the mimic was his own shadow. Man, I hate that. First of all, was his shadow real? Yeah, it was real. Does a shadow have the power to control a person's actions? No, it could only mimic them. But his shadow did take control momentarily in his life. Why? Because he allowed himself to be so distracted, addicted, you might say, that he completely forgot what he was supposed to be about. And that's a pretty good description of the sin nature we carry within us as redeemed people. It can cause havoc, even though it's been made powerless by our identification with Christ. You see, the body itself is not sinful, but the fallen nature that controls the body is sinful. And isn't it amazing what we can do, what we can say that's not of God? And again, I, I think it's easy for us to understand this kind of fighting and warring and selfishness from the world, but when it happens within the church with Christians, it's not a good thing, because it shouldn't be happening. And what's interesting is, you know, James doesn't even deal with the issue who's right or who's wrong, does he? What does he deal with? He deals with the selfish spirit that's being manifested in their lives. The ugliness of bitterness that's being manifested in their lives. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 1.11 said, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. You guys are fighting. Why? Chloe was probably a businesswoman, a Christian, and she's telling Paul through her representatives that are traveling back and forth from Corinth to Ephesus, where Paul wrote this letter, and they're telling Paul that there's trouble in Corinth with a capital T, right? We got problems here. They allowed their differences to divide up the body of Christ, to cause quarrels, contentions, and they used names to back up their cause, to justify their actions. And it's a sad picture. And Paul says, you know, you guys are dividing Christ when we're supposed to be one in Christ. Selfishness. It's all about you. That is the flesh nature. It's not the nature of God. I don't know if you heard the story. You probably did. A very contentious Quaker who went from one church to another. He never could find one that he liked. He was looking for that true church. And one day someone was bold enough to ask him, you know, well, what church are you in now? He replied back, I'm in the true church now. Really, said the man. How many belong to it? Well, the Quaker replied back, just my wife and myself, and I'm not sure about her sometimes. That's how it is, though, right? It's crazy. In fact, Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, put it like this. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. As the babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. For you're still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For one says, I'm of Paul. Another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Can we be carnal as Christians? Absolutely. Paul's calling them brethren, babes in Christ. And they're not growing up. In fact, the word for carnal in the Greek speaks of being characterized by the flesh. That's it. It's the flesh that's controlling us. We're dominated by the flesh. And we have to understand, you know, what, yes, when we come to Christ, we're justified. All our sins have been paid in full. It's, there's no record of our sins anymore because Christ paid them all. And that's where some people stop, some Christians stop, with justification. But as soon as you're saved, the sanctification process starts, where God is molding and shaping you to be more like Him. But if you allow the flesh to control your life, you remain carnal and fleshly. You don't grow up. Again, here in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 21, Paul said, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish. 
and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. You know, Paul hears of their problems, their selfishness. He wants them to repent to change before he arrives. And if they don't, he's not only going to continue to mourn over their condition, but he's going to deal with them. He's not going to let them continue on in this selfish way. You know, Paul or Calvin tells us about what Paul did. He said, Paul reveals to us the mind of a true and sincere pastor when he says that he will look on the sins of others with grief. Absolutely. You don't rejoice in their sin, their condition, you mourn over it because the enemy's ripping them off. They're hurting themselves, they're hurting those around them. I mean, you think about what happens with divorce, right? It just doesn't affect two people. It affects children, it affects family members, it affects friends. And, you know, couples will say, well, I just don't love them anymore. Love isn't a feeling, it's an act of your will. You have to decide for yourself. You have to purpose in your self. I love this. I'm going to be with this person forever. Even if it kills me, and it might. <laughs> I, there is no way. It's an act of my will. I desire to be with them. But today we go on feelings. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because it's the flesh. We need to be careful because we can let little things grow into something that's not even real. I mean, I had someone who got mad at me because during a resurrection service, I didn't speak of the Feast of first fruits. I just spoke of the resurrection, and they were mad at me. Well, there's a lot of things I don't say. I mean, you want to be here all day? That's fine. I could talk all day. You know that. <laughs> But that wasn't my focus that day. Now, if I brought up here the Easter bunny and we had an Easter egg hunt, yeah, you can get mad at me because that's wrong. But because I didn't say Feast of First Fruits, but you see how those little things? Maybe it's the jacket I'm wearing today, or the tie, or my hair. Who cares? Right? Those aren't the issues. What does God have for me? We should, everyone should come to church going, I wonder what God has for me today. Not, I wonder what the pastor's going to wear today. Hopefully not that outfit he did last week, right? And this was a problem in the early church. This is James' early church, right? Do you think it's a problem today? Of course it is. Why would the Holy Spirit include this if this wasn't going to be an issue? And we can't ignore it. We have to look at it. You know, James says in verse 2 here of James 4, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. Again, the heart of the matter here is the flesh. And it causes us to do all kinds of things. But you think, murder? I haven't murdered anyone. I get mad at them, but I haven't murdered them. Well, think about this. Is he talking about physically murdering someone? I don't think so. I think it's ruining, murdering someone's reputation through gossip and other things. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. I mean, yes, the scriptures are very clear. We are not to murder. And the punishment for premeditated murder was death. But Jesus takes this external command and he makes it internal as well. He's not 
adding to the Word of God or coming against the Old Testament. He's coming against the rabbinic tradition. He's showing what this is all about. Because they thought they're doing good. Hey, didn't murder anyone. Then don't you hear people say that today? You know, we're all sinners separated from God. Hey, you know, I'm not a perfect person, but I haven't murdered anyone. Like, that's kudos for you. Good. Because if you did, man, I'm out of here. One sin will keep you out of heaven. But one Savior, Jesus, will allow you to go in if you come to him. If you have anger in your heart, Jesus says, it can lead to murder and you're guilty. In fact, John says in 1 John 3.15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's pretty heavy. And, you know, Jesus in, in Matthew 5, he moves from really plain anger to raka, which is a word that meant the person was a brainless idiot. <laughs> they were stupid. You can just see this getting mad. Oh, you're, you're a fool, you're an idiot. And then he talks about the fool, which the Greek word, uh, we get our English word moron from. You're a moron, man. I like what Bruce says. He sums it up like this. He says, Raka expresses contempt for a man's head, you stupid. Moros expresses contempt for his heart and character, you scoundrel. And what Jesus is saying here is you can let anger grow inside of you so much that it can land you in hell. You know, our, can we be so angry at people that we're really not even saved? That's a heavy warning. And again, I don't think you can lose your salvation if you're angry at someone, but you can break that fellowship with God. You can hinder the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. And your life could be a living hell because God is trying to draw you back. And you think about it. You know, you look at church splits, the fights that go on within the church, you find that the, it's primarily because someone wants something and they'll do anything to get it. They're self-seeking. You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I think that would put an end to the problem, right? You seek the kingdom of God, you seek his righteousness and God will give you what you need. One writer put it like this. He said, the evidences of internal conflict are, are legion in society today. The proliferation of psychologists and psychiatrists, counselors and therapists of all sorts, clinics for the treatment of a host of emotional and psychological disorders, the increased problems of drug addiction, domestic violence and abuse, dreadful crimes, alcoholism, and of suicide give abundant evidence that personal disorders have reached a crisis point. The increase of impatience, frustration, anger, and hostility is not only seen in street crime, but vividly portrayed on modern highways where drivers use obscene gestures, dangerous acts of intimidation, and sometimes even gunfire to vent their displeasure at what another driver does or fails to do. Again, you know, we can understand this kind of activity in the world, but when we see this kind of conflict in the church, that's hard, and it's not of God, it's of the flesh, not a good thing. And if you're struggling with the idea that this is the flesh, I mean, you look at these three verses in James chapter 4, and you find the word you and your some 11 times. 11 times in three verses. And the point's simple. The flesh loves to resurrect its ugly head, and when that flesh nature is manifested in our lives, it's never a good thing. It's destructive. Turn over to Romans for a second, chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse 5 of Romans chapter 8, where Paul said this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Did you notice where this war is at, where this battle is fought? It's in the mind. And the flesh tries to control the mind, and the spirit tries to control the mind. And that's the big deal for us. Where is our mind set upon, the flesh or the spirit? Who are we surrendered to, the flesh or the spirit? Who are you feeding the flesh or the spirit? Because whatever the focus of your life is, is what's going to be manifested in your life. And it's really easy to tell how you're walking. What are you saying? How are you responding to situations? And I'm sure each and every day we run into an issue where we say something and go, wow, where did that come from? (laughs) Right? The flesh. It was about me. I didn't take any time to, Lord, what do you want me to say? I want to surrender to you. Yeah, I want to bop this guy in the nose, but Lord, I know that's not right. But boy, I could let my words really tear him to pieces. And Paul says, man, if you're walking after the flesh, you're at war with God. That's not a good thing. In fact, Spurgeon said it's not black, but blackness. It is not at enmity, but enmity itself. It's not corrupt, but corruption. It's not rebellious, it's rebellion. It is not wicked, it is wickedness itself. The heart, though it be deceitful, is positively deceit. It is evil in the concrete. Sin in the essence. It is the distillation, the quite a sense of all things that are vile. It is not envious against God, it is envy. It is not enmity, it is actual enmity. It's all about me. And I'm not saying that you know, a believer who sins faces eternal death Uh, hell, but they lose the joy of walking in the Spirit. What do you owe your own sinful flesh nature? Absolutely nothing. I mean, think about it. Where have we all come from? We, We were saved out of various situations in our lives. We were all saved. Some of us were doing things that were really dangerous, involved in drugs or other things. Some of us weren't. But we're all saved. What does the flesh have to offer us? Nothing. Then why are we enticed by it? Because we allow the world and the devil to influence us. You watch the TV commercials. You know, I I, I really like watching sports especially football, and, you know, it is amazing the worldly commercials that appear on football games. What are they trying to do? They're trying to tempt your flesh, right? And they do succeed. Otherwise, they wouldn't pay millions of dollars to have their commercials on TV. You buy their products. What benefits did your old sinful nature give to you? Absolutely none. I was, for the most part, I was a pretty nice guy. But, ask Julie, you pushed me to the point, and I was a madman. I'm not a big guy, you know? You don't have to be big to intimidate people. You just got to look crazy. Before I got saved, long before I got saved, I, I played, we lived, Julie and I lived out in Arizona, and I played on a couple different softball teams, and I was playing in a softball team with one of my friends, and Julie was watching the game. And I think this was before we were married, right? So I don't know how, why she married me, but she did, praise God. But uh, 
I, I was over on first base. I had gotten a hit, and the guy in first base spoke to me in Spanish because in Arizona, I was really, really dark. I looked like I was Mexican, and people always spoke to me in Spanish. I had no idea what they were saying. And my friend, who happened to be over by the first base side, said, do you know what he just said about your girlfriend, Julie? And he, I don't know why he told me. I was much better off not knowing, but he told me. We, you would have to slow the film down to see how fast I put that guy up against the fence. This guy was bigger than me. I had him up against the fence. I don't even know if he understood what I was saying. But I was a crazy man. In the car, someone cut me off. That was it, man. This is my road, right? This is all about me. I would be on their bumper. My poor wife was terrified. She'd be fearful we were all going to die and probably could have. But God did something amazing. He took that old sinful nature stuff and replaced it with his love. You know, someone cuts me off now, I'm like, you know, maybe they didn't see me, I don't know, whatever. Does the flesh want to resurrect itself at times? Oh, yeah, come on. You know, I, I, when I'm heading home and I'm on Rapids and the, there's a Lutheran high school there and there's two lanes then then merge into one, I'm always in the right lane because I'm going to make a right-hand turn. And for whatever reason, cars, when they see you're in this lane, they want to speed up so you don't get in front of them. And it's, it's kind of weird, but my flesh nature, when I see someone speeding up, what do I want to do? I want to speed up. I'm not going to cut in front of them. I just want to irritate them, you know? And I really have to... I, so what now, I, now I learned, Joe, just turn on your turn signal and just ignore it. But that's that flesh nature. It's amazing how it could just rise up. It, the silliest things. Who cares if they go faster? I don't care. I turn my turn signal on so they don't have to worry about it. I'm not cutting you off, man. I'm staying here. I'm going to make a right-hand turn. That's the flesh nature. So if we don't owe the sinful flesh nature anything, if there's no benefit to the old sinful flesh nature, why are we feeding it? Feed the spirit. Starve the flesh. We don't owe the flesh nature anything. We owe the, owe the, we owe the Lord everything. Look at what he's done in our lives. Paul said in, in Titus 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I've said it so many times before, God is not interested in making us into happy people. He's interested in making us into holy people. And I'll tell you what, as you surrender to God, as you give your life to Him, there is tremendous joy. You know, that was one of the teachings at the conference this weekend, is surrender. Are we willing to offer our lives on the altar of sacrifice every morning and say, Lord, here I am, my life is yours. Do with it as you please. Take all of me. What happens is we go, well, I like this part. No, you're not, and that's not good. That's not going to happen. But you can have the rest. No, God says we should place our whole bodies, Paul said in Romans 12, on the altar of sacrifice, a living sacrifice to God. And we, you cannot do this in your own strength, by your own power, but by the power of God's Spirit working in us and through us. It's really the sanctification process. You know, the Scottish theologian David Brown wrote, if you don't kill sin, it will kill you. Yeah. That flesh nature, man. And Paul said he battled with the flesh on a daily basis. Why do we think we don't have to deal with it? Of course we do. And if you don't, it will grow. As you feed it, it's like an ugly monster. It wants more and more and more. And it's never satisfied. And you look at this world today. I mean, look at a, a, the, this nation. All that we have. We have so much. And are we a nation that is satisfied? We're not. 
Because we're looking for satisfaction, joy in things. And you'll never find it there. Our satisfaction is in the Lord. Obeying Him. You know, we, we laugh at the millennials and say that, you know, wow, they're like snowflakes, you know. We listen to these fights and, oh, it's like, oh my gosh, you guys are snowflakes. you got to get a backbone here, you know. But what about us? Do we as Christians act like snowflakes? Think about that for a minute. Think about the fights that happen within church. I'll give you just a couple examples the argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. That was a fight in a church. From what I understand, scripturally, it can't be any more than 1.5 inches longer than the pastor's beard. So, just keep that in mind. A fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. I don't know. You know what? They're dead. They're living. Let's, let's do something for the kids that are living, okay? Not for the adults that are dead over here, right? And I don't know. It, it's crazy. There was a fight, a dispute, of whether or not to install restroom stall dividers in the women's restroom. Hey, what about in the men's? Come on. But we fight over things. It's crazy. A, an argument and vote to decide if a clock in the worship center should be removed. I, I don't even get that one. A fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. Who took the picture? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just interested. I don't know. <laughs> a dispute over whether the worship leader should have his shoes on during the service. Yes, he should. <laughs> Please, I'm standing up here. Come on. Here's one. I, I guess I don't get it. An argument over discover, discovery that the church budget was off 10 cents and someone gave a dime to settle the issue. They're fighting over 10 cents. Sense. People are dying not knowing the Lord, and we're arguing over 10 cents? I don't get it. A dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper had cran grape juice instead of grape juice. I've been guilty of that one, sorry. I've done that. A business meeting arguments about whether the church should purchase a weed eater or not, and it took two business meetings to resolve. That's just wacky, right? Sorry. All right, here's one. You tell me what to do here. Arguments over what type of green beans the church should serve. None! <laughs> no, I do like green beans. <laughs> the, they fought over the types of coffee. We use Folgers, right? I don't know what we use here. This is the crazy stuff. And it's sad. You know? Why are we fighting over these issues? Does it matter what color the church walls are, or the carpeting or whatever? I remember in Costa Mesa years ago when Calvary Chapel was getting started and, and um, hippies were getting saved all over the place, man. They were coming to know the Lord. They were hungry. God's Spirit was moving on them. And they were coming to church wearing either sandals or no shoes at all, bare feet. The clothes were a little dirty. Carpeting was getting dirty. And some of the people, they put a sign up that they had to have shoes on if they were going to come in. And Pastor Chuck happened to come to church early that Sunday morning, saw the sign and took it down. And he said, look, if you're concerned about the carpet, this new carpet getting dirty, let's pull it up. You see, are we putting 
things in front of people. I'm sorry, you don't meet our standards to come into the church. You've got to clean yourself up before you come in. Are you kidding me? That is the most ridiculous thing. But they will, people will fight over these issues. You know, length of hair. I don't care. My hair is short because I'm lazy. I love hair. When I was younger, if you saw the wedding pictures on Facebook that I posted, I had long hair. And man, when that was humid out, whoa, it was out there, you know? Now, I don't want to get up in the morning and spend 15 minutes trying to fix my hair. I want to get up in the morning, throw some water on it, comb it, I'm good to go. I'm just lazy. I don't care what length of hair. I don't care if you have a tattoo. I don't care. I don't care what color your hair is. What I care about is do you know Jesus? And are you growing? Are you maturing in the faith? That's the most important thing. But it's crazy what people will fight over and get upset over. I've had people get upset years ago about the music. Oh, that's, you know, that Christian music. Well, it is. It's all about Jesus. I, you know, my point was, look, there's styles of music I don't like. I just don't like them. But it's not the style of the music. It's the words. What are the words saying? Are they pointing us to the Lord? Or are they just empty words that speak about someone above that can help us? Those are empty words. We need to know who they're talking about. And that, this goes on in all churches, guys. It's crazy what people get mad about. I've been accused of not teaching from the old or books from the Old Testament. Is that, that's like crazy. Because I've been here 23 years. I've been through the Old Testament twice, every book, except well Genesis through Deuteronomy. We've only been through once because before I came up here, they were going through. They finished up in Deuteronomy, and I picked up in Joshua. I've been through it. But do you see how crazy it is? If people were honest and get, them, get their focus off of themselves, they'd be more concerned, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to reach people for Jesus? Because isn't it all about Him? It's, you know, heaven's going to be very different because it's not going to be about us at all. And God says, I want to work on you down here. It's not about you down here. It's about me. We're bond servants of Christ. We have freely given our lives to Jesus, right? As a bond servant. And bond servants don't go, yeah, but what do I get out of this? No. Lord, what do you need done? What can I do for you, Lord? How can I serve you? That's surrendering to him. Placing our lives in his hands, saying, Lord, use me. You know, James, in verses 2 and 3 here in, in James uh, chapter 4, he put it like this. He said, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. It's interesting. These fights are for things that they desire. And sometimes they ask God up for them, sometimes they don't. But even if they do ask, they're asking amiss. Which, the Greek, it has a basic meaning of being bad, evil, diseased, sick, not good. And they want to spend it on their own pleasures instead of what God desires. In fact, the word spend is the same verb used in Luke 15, 14 of the wasteful spending of the prodigal son. When we pray, when we go before the Lord, we're not praying to change God's mind. God's not in heaven going, wow, I didn't think of it that way. That's really good, Joe. No, God already knows what I need. Now I'm seeking direction from him. Right? That's what we're doing. Aligning our will with his will to accomplish his will on this earth and not our own. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So intense was that time that he was sweating drops of blood. And he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. That's pretty intense. And then he said, 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There are things that have happened in my life that I like, Lord, man, let another way happen because I don't want to go down this road. It's going to be too painful, too hard. But in the end, it's surrender. But not my will, Lord, yours, because you know what's best for me. I, I don't know what's best for me. I think I do, but many times I'm wrong. And I want your will to be done in my life, not my own. But when there's self-seeking and trying to get your will done, it's all kinds of contentions that go on. Conflicts. And you think, well, what can we do about it? Well, there is a solution. We've talked about it. We're not to be slaves to sin. And thus we need to purpose in our heart what we're going to do. Turn over to Romans again, chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 6 of Romans 6. Listen to what Paul says here. We're going to read down to verse 14. In Romans 6, starting in verse 6, Paul said this, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away or rendered inoperative, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon or consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments or weapons of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Crucifying the flesh. And... You will never find anywhere in the scriptures that we are to put the flesh away for a rainy day to use again. <laughs> no, you don't play with it. You crucify it. It's kind of like playing with a poisonous snake. You don't play with a poisonous snake. It's going to bite you. You get rid of it. And you don't go back to it. And that's what Paul's talking about. In Colossians 3.5, he said, Therefore put to death... Your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Walk in the Spirit. You're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And God will take care of us. You know, just go before Him. Seek His direction. It's not that you can't pray for things. You can. But we always pray, God, your will be done. And he's not going to give us things that are going to feed our carnality or hinder our spiritual growth. He will allow those things in our life. If that's what you want, go ahead. Try it for a while. See what happens. With the idea of returning back to him. You see, God's in the business of restoration, not destruction. When you see someone's life who's walked away from God and you see how destructive it is, just the turmoil it's in, you know, that's the devil. And he wants to wipe them out completely. But God wants them to go till they come to the end of themselves and then they turn back to him to be restored. That's our God. Obviously, we have a few more weeks here to look at this topic of where do wars come from. And we've looked at the flesh. We're going to be looking at the world and the devil. And before I close, let me share this with you. We're told this section oozes with the frustration and disappointment of unrequited pleasure seeking. You want literally lust for something, but don't get it. So you kill frustration and you covet literally hotly desire, but you cannot have what you want, frustration. 
and in frustration you quarrel and fight. The frantic pleasure-first life invariably goes after that which cannot satisfy. An intriguing, intriguing experiment shows that the male butterfly will ignore a living female butterfly of his own species in favor of a painted cardboard one. If the cardboard one is big, if the cardboard one is bigger than he is, bigger than any female butterfly could be, the male butterfly jumps the piece of cardboard. Nearby, the real living female butterfly opens and closes her wings in vain. Wow, how true that is. Hollywood, all painted up, right? Oh, I want what they have. Really? That's what you want? No, I want what the Lord has. He goes on, similarly, the cardboard pleasures of, of this age have a whole world fluttering after them in perpetual dissatisfaction. When the pleasure-seeking person gets what he wants, it does not satisfy. Dr. Samuel Johnson wisely said, Of all that have tried the selfish experiment, let one come forth and say that he has succeeded. He that has made gold his idol, has it satisfied him? He that has toiled in the fields of ambition, has he been repaid? He that has ransacked every theater of sensual enjoyment, is he content? Can any answer in the affirmative? Not one. And I find that interesting. I think it was Rockefeller was asked, how much more money do you want to make? Just a little bit more. Just, really? How much? It'll never end. It's always a little bit more. John McMurray put it even more succinctly. He said, the best cure for hedonism or pleasure-seeking is an attempt to practice it. Now, is James saying Christians are never to passionately desire pleasure? No. It's okay to enjoy a day in the sun, the pleasures of sightseeing, a run in the country. Fine meal, barbecue, brats, ball games, joys of marital intimacies, the pleasures of tennis or golf, a roller coaster ride, a good book or concert. The Christian life is not a life of negation, but of affirmation and enjoyment. We should be the biggest, in a sense, pleasure seekers in the universe because of all that God has given us. There's tremendous pleasure out there for us. What the devil has done is he's, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is he's perverted the pleasures that God has given to us. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, has the senior devil say to his understudy, Wormwood, this. He said, never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it's his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures... All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced at times, or in ways, or in degrees, which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. How true that is. One example is that regarding sex. And for some Christians, they think sex is a dirty word or that it's only for having children and nothing else. That's not what the scriptures say. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. God has given us the pleasure of sexual relationships between a husband and wife. That's very clear. But also that verse says, Fornicators and adulterers God will judge. You see, God tells us what he has given to us, and it's good. It's for enjoyment. But Satan comes in and perverts that. So our flesh will be satisfied, and it never is. God says sexual relationships between a husband and a wife is good. Satan says, why stop there? What about with people that are not married? Or married and having sex with someone other than your spouse? Or what's the big deal about a man and a woman having sexual relations? Why not, why not a man and a man or a woman and a woman? Do you see what happened here? What was good, what God had given to us, Satan perverted. And instead of finding satisfaction in what God has given to us, we look elsewhere, and as Mick Jagger said, we just can't get no satisfaction. 
You look at the world and they're not satisfied in the relationships that they have because they're not centered in what God has established. And I will close this morning. If you're at war with someone, if you're fighting with someone, if you're seeking your own fleshly desires instead of what God desires, you need to repent. You need to surrender your life to the Spirit of God and let Him guide you in your speech and in your actions. I mean, that's what James is saying here very clearly, guys. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Oh, Lord, help us to crucify the flesh, to die to self, so we can live for Him, right? It's all about Him. And every day we get up, we place our life on the altar of sacrifice. God, use me. Don't go running away. Let Him use you. And sometimes it's really, really hard, guys. It's not easy. But He can help us through those times. He will. So we've been looking in the book of Acts. We see how God was working through Paul and his men, right? But as God was working, all of a sudden the devil comes in and tries to stop the work. And it would have been easy for Paul to say, I give up. I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to roll myself up in a little ball and hide away. It's not what he did. God encouraged him in the work he was doing. God brought brothers and sisters into his life to encourage him in the work that he was doing. We need to be able to do that for each other as well. Correction, always in love with the idea of restoration, building up, edifying people. And not let little issues that are really meaningless cause fights. Because there is a world out there that needs Jesus. And when the world looks at the church, they go, look, they can't even get along. Why do I want that? It shouldn't be. If we truly surrender to him, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's pray. Father, some tough lessons here. And I'm sure we all have some of these issues in our life that we're dealing with. Where that flesh tries to resurrect itself and it's a battle every day. But Lord... As your word said, the battle belongs to you. And we need to be able to surrender to you and to walk in the Spirit, not feed the flesh. Help us to do that, Lord. For all of us, strengthen us in the inner man that the work you're doing inside of us would overflow in our actions and our words, that people would see that we are men and women who love Jesus and love them. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for just sharing these words with us from James. Lord, difficult words, and yet so important for our lives. Help us to apply these things. In Jesus' name, amen.